Amen. Romans chapter 16, Paul begins wrapping up the book. It's probably the most extensive farewell salutations that you find in uh, the writings of Paul. And uh, we're not going to go in a verse by verse order. We're going to go back up to verse uh, 1 and 2 uh, a little bit later on. But I want to go ahead and drop down to verse 16 because I want to tie it into the handout that I gave uh, tonight where Paul is giving these greetings to and he's naming all these people by name that he's given greetings to. In Romans 16 and verse 16, he says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now, we'll deal with the first sentence, then we'll deal with the second sentence in that verse. When he talks about greeting one another with a holy kiss, he is not introducing a new custom. That's something that was going on in the ancient world. You go all the way back to the time of Genesis, and you find that kissing was a greeting that took place in the ancient world, and even today in the Middle East and in some European countries, there is the kissing that goes on as a greeting. So Paul here is not introducing something new as a practice that is required of us to do. And the reason why I bring that up is because sometimes when you're talking to people who want to mock the concept of restoring New Testament Christianity and want to make fun of it, they'll say, well, you don't practice the holy kiss, so how can you say you're in the New Testament church? Because you claim to be the churches of Christ, but in the same verse it says to greet one another with a holy kiss, and y'all don't do that. Therefore, you can't be the New Testament church because you're not doing that. And that's usually how it goes. And basically what that is, is they're trying to find specks in our eyes. They have the plank of denominationalism in their eye, and they're trying to find specks in our eyes to, to criticize, it, criticize us and discredit us. Well, what needs to be pointed out is kissing as a form of greeting was a part of their custom of the ancient world. It's nothing that's being introduced here as something new. This is what they would do. Now, the emphasis is on holy kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss. In other words, when you greet one another... <clears throat> Your kiss is to be holy, it's to be righteous, it's to be genuine, it's to be sincere. In other places, it's called a, a kiss of love. In other places, he talks about greeting one another, and he doesn't even mention the word kiss. So there's various ways in which we can greet one another. And so the emphasis there in uh, verse 16, when it says, greet one another with a holy kiss, he's not telling them you must kiss in order to greet one another. That's, that would be silly. He's saying, make sure what you're doing is holy. Because wasn't there someone in the Bible that was betrayed with a kiss? Who was that? Christ. When Judas was bringing that mob out to get him in the, in the um, Garden of Gethsemane, he said, the one that I kiss, that's the one you arrest. That wasn't unusual for him to go up and kiss and greet Christ. But it was a kiss of betrayal. It was an unholy kiss. It was hypocritical. It wasn't genuine. Because of the fact that he was using a form of affection to identify Jesus so he could be arrested. So that kiss that was given was not a genuine sign of affection. Here you go, Rachel. And what he's saying here, as he says in other places... Let your affection be holy. Let it be righteous. Let it be genuine. Uh, we could say the same thing about a holy embrace. We can say the same thing about be holy in our handshake, greeting one another. Let it be genuine, but let it be righteous. So he's not doing something that was, or, in, or commanding something that was new. He was commanding something 
and regulating a custom to make sure that it was genuine and holy. Look at Acts chapter 27. No, excuse me, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Paul is giving his farewell address to the elders at Ephesus. Notice verse 36, Acts chapter 20 and verse 36. And when he had said these things, they knelt down and prayed with them all. Verse 37. Then they all wept freely, fell on Paul's neck, and kissed him. Verse 38. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. So here you have a kiss being given to show their love and appreciation for Paul. So it's not introducing a command for something that must be done, but regulating the fact that when you greet one another, it has to be genuine. It has to be sincere. It has to be holy. It has to be something that is uh, above reproach. So the holy kiss, when, when people would bring that up, if someone ever does, uh, tell them that in some cu- customs in the world, yes, brethren do greet one another with a holy kiss. And uh, I have been greeted with a holy kiss before. By women, by a man once. And there's, it's it's according to what you find here. Usually in our custom, there's a handshake or a hug. But the point is, keep it holy. Keep it righteous. Any questions or comments about that? Mm-hmm. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 20. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Second Corinthians thirteen twelve, mm-hmm. greet one another with a holy kiss. So again, uh, if you find the word kiss again in other places, it's usually designated just uh, uh, the concept of a, of a kiss of greeting uh, that you greet one another. Sometimes it'll just say at the end of a letter, greet one another, and so there are no kiss. Uh, like uh, Second Peter, excuse me, First Peter chapter five and verse fourteen at the end of his letter. First Peter five and verse fourteen: Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So a kiss of love. And sometimes he'll just say, "Greet one another," in some places. So the the kiss is not even mentioned in some places. Right. Well, the, the concept there of uh, keeping, keeping everything uh, righteous and within the custom of society, whatever it is appropriate, uh, you know, it would be awkward and be uh, counterproductive if we started kissing everyone who came in the door. Would it not? It would be very awkward and counterproductive if we started doing this and um, would, could cause problems. So he's not saying this as a command. This is how you have to greet one another. He's saying you, when you greet one another, make it holy. Be it a, 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 a greeting of love. Express yourself genuinely to one another. So that takes care of that first sentence there in Romans 16 and verse 16. Then he says, the churches of Christ greet you. The churches of Christ greet you. This is the only time churches of Christ in this form is found in the New Testament. 
the only time. Brethren today call themselves generally churches of Christ. And there's several reasons for that. Number one, it's biblical because of this passage here. Number two, about a hundred years ago, to distinguish us from the Christian church denomination that was formed, that went with the instrument and went with other unscriptural practices, brethren who were faithful to the New Testament just kept calling themselves churches of Christ. And number three, even though this is only found here once and churches of God is found about eight times, or church of God is found about eight times, in the plural form it's found three more times in the New Testament. There were a lot of Pentecostal denominations that were forming at the early part of the 1900s that were calling themselves churches of God. And so to cut down on confusion, brethren have just kind of gone with this designation of the brethren, churches of Christ. Now, as I've given you this handout, I want you to look at this, and I want you to see for yourself. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a sampling that I put on one one page. Of the various things the, the church is called to be of. The church or churches of is what I called this. Now, when you find this phrase, church of or churches of, it's telling you either... Where the church came from, who the church belongs to, or the composition of the church. What the church is composed of. If I say there is a a wall of concrete, what's the composition of that wall? Concrete. It's made out of concrete. That's the composition of the wall. A wall of concrete, the composition of it is concrete. So when you find a phrase, as we're going to look at this, we're going to see that it's used to describe that as well. So, of course, you have Romans 16, 16 here. But you have the church called the churches of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 16, But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, church of God and church of Christ are used interchangeably in the New Testament because Christ is God. He's the Son of God. He is God. So, it's talking about the same church. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, this designation is showing us the composition of the church. The church is composed of who? Saints. Is composed of saints. A saint is one who's been saved. Someone who's been sanctified by the blood of Christ when they're baptized into Christ. So the church is composed of saints. So 1 Corinthians 14.33 tells us the composition of the congregations. Saints. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 If you, brethren, become imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. He calls the churches of God there that are in Christ Jesus. There is a Pentecostal denomination known as the church of God in Christ. If you ever see that sign in front of a church building, there's a 99.9% possibility that that is a Pentecostal denomination because they have taken this phrase and applied it to themselves. Mm-hmm. I believe you're right. Called the Church of God in Christ. Sometimes it'll say, uh, Church of God in Christ of prophecy. That means they think they have prophets, they think they have revelations, they, th- they think the Holy Spirit's directly talking to them. So they they take this phrase and they apply it to themselves, even though that's not who they are. They're they're a Pentecostal denomination. You look at 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God 
for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. There's churches of God once again, and I believe, and you can do this study on your, yourself, eight times in the New Testament, the, the phrase churches of God is found. Wait a minute, I got that wrong. It might be eight times the word church of God is found, and then churches of God in the plural is just three more times, three times. I didn't write down those numbers. But the point is, the phrase churches of God or church of God is used more often than churches of Christ. Churches of Christ only being found once. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who are in every place, call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So Paul is writing to the church of Christ at Corinth, and he calls it the church of God because that's who they are. They are the church of God in Christ. They are the church of the saints. That's who they are. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, But if I delay, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So there is the church of the living God. And so that is referring uh, to the church coming from God and belonging to God. He is called the living God there. Then in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23, he's talking about the church, and he says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now notice what he calls the church. He calls it the general assembly of the firstborn. Now I used to think that was referring to Christ. But look at the wording of the verse. Church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. The firstborn there is referring to Christians. They're registered in heaven. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So in some translations it says firstborn ones. Indicating it's not referring to a firstborn as a singular, but firstborn as a plural who are registered in heaven. So again, this verse is telling us the composition of the church. It's those who are the firstborn whose names are in the book of life. So here we see the of the Lord's church. Now this, of course, as I said, is not an exhaustive list. That's not to even go into the other descriptions of the church where it's called the kingdom. Uh, You have 1 Timothy 3.15. It's called the house of God. It's called um, the people of God. It's called the priesthood. It's called a, uh, God's own special people. I mean, this various descriptions throughout the New Testament to describe God's people. Now, is the church in the Bible ever called Christian? Is the church in the Bible ever called Christian? No. So when brethren over 100 years ago started holding on to the phrase Christian church, and they broke off and and about 80% of them went with the instrument and went with uh, unscriptural practices, they formed the Christian church denomination. The church in the New Testament, is never called Christian. That's the name given to the disciples in the church, the saints in the church. In Isaiah 2 and verse 2, there was a prophecy made that a new name would be given when the Gentiles see the righteousness of God. In Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles see the righteousness of God. First Gentiles enter the church. Then in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26... It says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. It doesn't say the church was called Christian. So it is 
not proper to refer to the church as the Christian church, not biblical. Of course, we can go into a whole list of other denominational unbiblical names, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Catholic, Presbyterian, Moverian, Mennonite, just to name a few. What's that? Mormons. Mormons. Just to name a few that's unbiblical. Quakers are kind of a branch of the Mennonites. They're a branch off of them. But there's another one, Quakers. Yes, yes. And they're very strong in the Pennsylvania area. Up there in the, uh, where the Mennonites are very strong, and that's what the Amish are. They're Mennonites, and no electricity and all that stuff. Right. There are the, yeah, the more liberal branch, I guess you could call Mennonites. There's some in Emory that they use vehicles and such. I've seen their literature in uh, Emory, Texas to their church, and they, don't, they still don't use instruments. They sing without instruments like we do. Uh, but they use uh, vehicles and things, whereas the more strict Amish don't do that. So you have all these various branches and things of men, but when you look in the Bible, you see what the Bible has. It has only one church. It's organized in congregations, and these congregations are called various things. Church of Christ is not the official name of the church. It's one designation among various designations that the Bible gives to the church. And the principle we should abide by is we should call the church what the Bible calls the church. And if brethren want to go into a community and they want to start a congregation and they want to call it the church of the saints, I cannot go and tell them they're wrong. Now, it might be a little confusing nowadays. And another reason why we stuck with churches of Christ is in the spirit of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, speak the same things, be of the same mind and same judgment. To help us identify one another. Because if you go into a place and you see Church of God on a sign, you're going to automatically think that's Pentecostal. And there's a 99.9% chance you're right, that it is Pentecostal. But that is a scriptural designation given. given. And um, if if brethren don't know how to identify themselves in in the midst of this confusion, then it's going to be a hard time to meet with one another. Well, see, what you had in the first century, you didn't have any denominations. They didn't have any. So they could call themselves whatever the New Testament called them, because that's all they were. They were just Christians in the Lord's church. And so there wasn't all that confusion that we have today. Any questions or comments? Okay, let's go back to verse 1 and 2. Romans 16, verse 1 and 2. I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. You have this sister here named Phoebe, or Phoebe. Some people translate it Phoebe. And she is being commended by Paul. He is giving her a recommendation. And that's what you would find a lot of times in these New Testament letters when they would name somebody by name, say this is a fellow worker, this is a fellow soldier. I mean, you have a lot of this here in chapter 16. It's recommending them. So this, this is a good person. This is a good, faithful Christian. And, of course, that's, that was needed back then so they would know who they could trust. Who they could trust and, and who is a, a genuine person as far as a Christian is concerned. 
And it used to be years ago, and the brethren had got away from it, and it might be because there's so much church hopping going on nowadays, that when uh, brethren would go from one congregation to another congregation, whether they moved or whatever, they would have a letter of recommendation from their previous congregation by the elders or the leadership of the congregation to recommend this person to the other congregation. Now, if things didn't go well in that congregation, you may not want somebody writing a letter about you. <laughs> Especially if you had to fight some uh, unscriptural practices, they may not give you a glowing recommendation, so to speak. But um, I've only had that happen once, years ago, in this congregation. A lady moved here from Arkansas, older lady. Uh, she's since passed away. She uh, came here, and I got a letter in the mail from the congregation in Arkansas uh, recommending her as a faithful sister. And so I thought that was, uh, that was pretty neat. That goes along with what we find in the New Testament. But when we look at this word here, this word for servant, this word has caused a lot of brethren to go off on a tangent. Because the word servant here is diakonos in Greek. You know what word we get from diakonos? We get the word deacon from diakonos. Deacon is a transliteration of diakonos in Greek. And it means a servant, one who serves. And so people have latched on to this word, this, this sister, Phoebe, there in verse 1, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea, member of the Lord's church in Sincrea. And they say, well, that's the Greek word for deacon. Therefore, she must have been a deaconess. And so we need female deacons in the Lord's church. Phoebe was a, a deaconess. That's the word for deacon there, for servant. And so they latch on to this, and that's what some liberal-minded brethren have done. Now, I've had people in denominations, when I challenge them to show me a female pastor in the Bible, they'll go to these verses and try to make Phoebe a female pastor. Well, first of all, the word for pastor is nowhere in these verses. And we know other passages that make it very clear that a pastor is an elder and an elder is a male. So trying to make Phoebe a, a female preacher or a female pastor is uh, grasping and doesn't work. But we're going to have to be able to answer that because that kind of thing is going on and, and so many places, places that are influenced by ACU and other liberal universities, they're pushing for female leadership in the church. And so they want some, they want some female deacons. And they're going to push for female elders and female preachers. And so we're going to have to be able to answer this. The word for servant is used in the New Testament generically and specifically, officially. What we have here is we have the word servant used generically as a servant. She's a servant of the church in Sicria. This is referring to a female worker in the church. Nothing more. To try to read into it any more than that is, is just to mishandle the Word of God. We have female servants in this congregation. The word servant there is just used in the, in the broad sense of someone who serves the church and serves the Lord. Not that she has a leadership capacity in the church. We know from other passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Timothy chapter 2, that women cannot have a leadership role in the church over men. There's the male principle of leadership found in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. But women are servants of the church. That doesn't make them any less than men. In fact, a lot of the work gets done because of women in the church. 
And so the word here is used in the broad, generic sense of a servant. Jesus said one time, and the word is used, He said, if any among you wishes to be great among you, let him be your servant. That's that same word. Diakonos. From which we get the word deacon. Now, there is the official deacons in the church. And I say official because they're appointed within a congregation to be the servants of the church on a regular basis. They're not, uh, for lack of a better term, the ordinary servants of the church. They are special servants of the church, official servants of the church that are going to be working under an eldership as servants of a particular congregation. And they have specific qualifications they must meet in order to be in the official capacity of a deacon or these servants in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8 says, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested and let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent. Look at verse 12. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. These special, specific qualifications for these servants shows that it's referring to not generic servants, because you can be a servant of God and not even be married. You don't have to be married to be a servant of God. I know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul wasn't married that we know of. And he was a servant of God. Christ wasn't married. He was, he was a servant of God, the greatest servant of all. So to have these specified qualifications means this is official deacons or official servants of the church they must be men and they must be married and they must rule their children and their house well their wives must be reverent not slanderers temperate and faithful in all things their wives there i believe refers to the deacon's wives and the elders wives when you look at the whole context their their, their wives have to be uh, women who are behaving themselves in a proper way So these very specific instructions concerning the deacons rules out a woman being an official deacon. As far as the elders and the deacons are concerned within the organization of the church. And we know that's the simple organization of the church because you look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. When Paul wrote to the Lord's church at Philippi, what does it say? To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. That's it. The overseers and the servants. Elders and deacons. That's the simple organization of the local church. Now then, were women excluded from serving at all? Completely? No. We see this from Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. We have this Phoebe, who was evidently an outstanding woman, serving in the role and the capacity that she could serve in as a servant of the church. She was a servant of the church in Sincrea. Notice what Paul says about her in verse 2, that you might receive her in the Lord as a manner worthy of the saints. Assist her in whatever business she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many of myself also. Here is an apostle saying, this woman has helped me out. Helped me out. And she has been a helper of many. A servant of the church. So you don't have to be a, a, an elder to be a servant of the church. You don't have to be a deacon to be a servant of the church you don't have to be a preacher to be a servant of the church you can be a servant 
And this woman here having the godly characters that uh, would be commended by an apostle is not someone who wants to be in the limelight. She doesn't want to be in the spotlight. She, she wants to humbly serve the Lord and, and do what's right because it's the right thing to do. So this is not referring to someone who has a leadership position in the church, but someone who is a servant of the church. And so we have this great example of a woman that, that helped out Paul. It says in Luke's account of the gospel of Christ that there were women who supported Jesus out of their substance. Jesus was, during his earthly ministry, financially supported and helped by women. And so you see uh, these uh, godly women who are not trying to run the church, they're trying to serve the church. Trying to serve their church. And that is what we need in the church. We don't need women trying to run the church. They need to serve the church. And when they do, a lot of the church is work is getting done. Without them doing that, a lot of the work would not get done at all. So he's commending her. And, you know, this goes against uh, the concept of the day because women in that time were not looked upon highly. But... Paul believed what he wrote in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. Concerning those who are in Christ, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. One in Christ, but not equal in function. And we see that in, in, in every, everything else. Uh, you, your body, you have your digestive organs. They're not responsible for breathing. And your lungs are not responsible for digesting. They have their function within the body. But all of them working together harmoniously to keep the body running. So this is in no way, shape, form, or fashion referring to a female deaconess, another office of the church, or certainly not a female preacher or pastor. But I wanted you to be aware of that simply because this, these verses will be brought up because they've been brought up to me uh, concerning uh, women being in a leadership role in the church. I want to show you another per, a place where the, uh, the verse, the word uh, diakonos is used to describe a servant. It's the same word. Look at the uh, same book, Romans chapter 13. Verse 4, talking about government officials. Romans 13 and verse 4. Those in government. He is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister to avenge an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. The word minister there is the Greek word diakonos. Servant. Here he's talking about most of the people who aren't even saved. Some of them could be if they work for the government as Christians. But as government officials who are, who are upholding righteousness and righteous principles in the law of the land, they are described as God's deacons, diakonos, servants. So the point I'm making is that when you see the word diakonos uh, in referring to a servant, it does not always mean an official deacon in the church in the official capacity as you find it in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3 with those qualifications that are found. Now in the few minutes that we have remaining, I want to look at um, 
verse 3 and 4, we have Priscilla and Aquila. This godly man and woman who were introduced to in Acts chapter 18. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Here he's talking about the churches of the Gentiles, those who aren't Jewish. So you have this Aquila and Priscilla, this husband and wife, that every time we see them, they're doing something good for the church doing something good for the cause of Christ. In Acts chapter 18, when they hear Apollos preaching and they hear that he, he doesn't have a full understanding of what baptism is, Aquila and Priscilla pull aside Apollos apart and they, they study with him because he only knew the baptism of John. And so you have this Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, uh, working together for the cause of Christ. And it's always wonderful and beautiful when a husband and wife are working together to further the cause of Christ. Every Christian couple should want to be an Aquila and Priscilla. Now, next week, Lord willing, we'll look at some of the other passages uh, that are in Romans chapter 16, and then we'll wrap up this book. There's a lot of other lessons to be learned here as well.